Okay, part three, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. The colon isn't the only place that can have fermentation, putrefaction, and dysbiosis. It take, can take place in the small intestine as well. Now, there are bacteria we want in the small intestine to do things like conjugate bile acids uh, and other functions, but in a healthy small intestine microbiome, there is a thousand times less bacteria than the large intestine and with a far smaller genetic diversity. When you start seeing large amounts of things like E. coli and Klebsiella uh, and Micrococcus in the small intestine, you're dealing with SIBO. So let's talk about eight natural protections that we have against them because I, based on stool tests, it looks like about 70% of the population has some degree of SIBO. Now, the first protection would be essential oils and bitter tannins and phenols that we would get in a freshly gathered primitive plant-based diet. Uh, these compounds suppress bacterial growth in small intestine where we don't want it. And part of the brilliance of the design of the human body is these essential oils that suppress bacterial growth in the small intestine are absorbed as nutritional oils so they don't make it to the large intestine and they don't suppress bacteria in the large intestine. And the same with these bitter elements. They're absorbed along with the bile so they don't make it to the large intestine in large numbers. So these essential oils and bitters act as a selective small intestine suppressant against SIBO without causing that same problem as much in the large intestine. Unfortunately, since the agricultural revolution, we've selectively bred our plants to be sweeter and less bitter. In addition to that, the food we eat is rarely fresh uh, and essential oils are gone within three hours of harvest. So unless you have a garden outside of your kitchen and you pick fresh rosemary and oregano, you're probably not getting any essential oils unless you take them uh, as a supplement. Uh, so this increase in the fermentable sugars by having food be sweeter and the decrease in the essential oils and the bitter elements is one of the many reasons people have SIBO. And to help with the situation, I made a product called Zoibin. And there it is. Uh, it contains essential oils and bitters that uh, I'm using to recreate uh, the protection we would be getting normally if we were... Uh, primitive hunter-gatherers, and we would have gotten automatically just by virtue of what we eat. Okay, the second protection is the disinfecting aspect of stomach acids. Unfortunately, as we age, many of us uh, lose the ability to make enough stomach acid for it to do its complete disinfective work, and so uh, for some people, they're going to need to take additional stomach acids, uh, additional, they're going to need to support their stomach acid production, and they can take things like betaine hydrochloride, and you can look online for uh, little tests you can do at home to measure your stomach acid production. It's very easy. Okay, the third protection is bile production. Bile has a detergent-like effect uh, which disrupts the lipid membrane and, uh, and kills a lot of bacteria in the small intestine. Uh, and uh, the other thing uh, that bile does, a fourth protection, is it triggers the FXR receptors in the ileum at the end of the small intestine uh, to secrete natural antibiotics to kill any bacteria that might reflux back up into the colon from a issue with the ileocecal valve, which we'll talk about in a minute. If you think that you might have some problems with um, bile, meaning uh, either stones or sludge, and it's just not moving properly, you could consider our Glitamins product, which we've been making for uh, 20 years now, I think, uh, to support the body and proper bile uh, health. Okay. A fifth protection would be the pancreas, which secretes enzymes that, in addition to digesting food, digest bacteria. That's uh, so another thing that happens as we get older is we tend to lose um, pancreatic digestive capacity, so you could consider taking pancreatic enzymes. A sixth protection is a functioning ileocecal valve, and that's a little sphincter valve uh, between the end of the small intestine and the beginning of the large intestine, and to find out where it is roughly, uh, draw a line between your belly button and the front bony prominence on your right hip and halfway up that line between the two roughly is your uh, ileocecal valve. And if you press in there and it's uncomfortable, you may have some ileocecal issues and what that can mean is uh, bacteria can squirt back up from the large intestine to the small intestine. Um, one of the things you can do is you can actually just massage that if it's uncomfortable. But the other issue is if you have had surgeries in the abdomen, uh, the abdomen is known for forming adhesions. Uh, and if you get an adhesion, meaning the connective tissue gets stuck and starts pulling, it can torque the ileocecal valve into an open position or not, not close it all the way, and that can be an issue. And then you could look at things like our castor oil packs and Notoplex, which we have um, where we're making uh, serapeptase as a suppository if you want some support dealing with scar tissue, if you think that's 
uh, forcing open your ileocecal valve. Okay, seventh protection is the immune system. There's a huge immune function in the intestines. Uh, so obviously your immune system has to be functioning properly. And the eighth protection would be something called giant migratory contractions or migrating motor complexes, which are these powerful moving contractions triggered by the hormone motilin. They last about 12 minutes and they squeeze any remaining undigested food out of the small intestine and into the large intestine. In the same way we don't want carbohydrates, fats, and uh, proteins leaving the small intestine for the large intestine because it'll cause putrefaction, dysbiosis, and excessive fermentation. We don't want fibers and oligosaccharides hanging in the small intestine. They belong in the large intestine. And if they hang out in the small intestine for a long time because the transit time is low, then you can end up uh, stimulating SIBO. So in any case, uh, we need to have this migrating motor complex to sweep the material out of the small intestine into the large intestine, which is why in the last talk we talked about how you don't want to eat um, late at night and have late night snacks. You want at least 12 hours between dinner and breakfast so you can have the empty small intestine so you can sleep and get that migratory contraction so you can squeeze out all the stuff that would otherwise just sit there and ferment all night. Okay, let's talk about gas production. There are four main gases that are produced in the intestines. Hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and methane. We're meant to have some hydrogen in our gut. Normal bacteria create hydrogen. Now, the fate of that hydrogen is some of it should escape the gut and get into the bloodstream, and from there it's an antioxidant, and some of it actually gets converted into the short-chain fatty acid acetate uh, by good bacteria. The challenge is if you make too much hydrogen or you don't have the bacteria to convert it to acetate, the hydrogen builds up and it can cause loose stools and then a few other things. Uh, one of the things excess of hydrogen can turn into is hydrogen sulfide. Uh, and that's the rotten egg smell that some people will get in their gas. Sulfate, sulfite, and sulfur reducing bacteria like desulfibrio and E. coli, staph, and strep can turn hydrogen uh, or can combine hydrogen with sulfur and make hydrogen sulfide. Now you need a certain amount of hydrogen sulfide in your body, uh, prevents bacterial translocation, it helps with the gut mucosa, stabilizes arterial plaque, uh, participates in healing, but too much of it can cause cell damage, leaky gut, and Parkinson's and other problems. The, the key is to have the right amount. So if you're getting a rotten egg smell in your stool or in your gas, that's hydrogen sulfide uh, and you've got too much. So in this case, you can consider lem uh, lowering the amount of sulfur-bearing foods you eat. So take a look at sulfur-rich foods. Uh, but you still need to get sulfur. So you could try taking Epsom salt baths. And that is a way to get sulfate, uh, which is what most people are low on, especially with all the glyphosate uh, getting, uh, making it break down, um, without increasing sulfur in the gut if you're uh, a hydrogen sulfide producer. You could also do the herbs dongshen. Um, sometimes the molybdenum deficiency will cause it. Uh, will cause uh, hydrogen sulfide, and green tea is another supplement. Okay, carbon dioxide. That's another normal constituent of the gut uh, microbiome pr process. But uh, if you've got too much or if you're eating, uh, drinking a lot of carbonated beverages, it can combine with hydrogen to form methane, and methane's a problem. Methane is made by uh, the archaea. They're not actually bacteria. They're a little bit more primitive, but we can think of them like bacteria. And they'll, uh, methane, methanogenic archaea, like Methanobrevibacter, Smithy, uh, they can turn hydrogen and carbon dioxide into methane. Uh, methane alters transit time by causing contractions in the intestinal muscles, like uh, spasms. It slows down peristalsis and it can paralyze intestinal nerves. Now, if you have excess methane in your body, you can experience things like memory loss, headaches, fatigue, blurred vision, rapid breathing, rapid heart rate, fainting, convulsions, and abnormal emotions. To know for sure, consider purchasing something called the Food Marble Air 2 Breath Tester. And that'll show you how much methane and hydrogen you're producing every day. So the goals, if you're making methane, is one, to decrease excessive hydrogen production. Uh, and that's about bringing, back, um, bringing SIBO um, under control and stopping carbohydrate fermentation. And the second is to support the actinogenic bacteria like Laudia hydronotrophica, which take the hydrogenic acetate, which is something you need. Um, all right, so now in these talks we've focused on the importance of supporting symbiotic bacteria and suppressing parasitic bacteria in our microbiome, but there's also symbiotic and parasitic fungi, viruses, and possibly even protozoa.
S. boulardii is a symbiotic fungi that you can actually buy as a supplement, whereas Candida is a parasitic fungi. Um, there are many uh, viruses that are symbiotic. Uh, they are called bacteriophages, where I suppose um, norovirus is an intestinal virus, it's parasitic. Uh, and while modern medicine only considers protozoa to be parasitic, I think in time we'll find that there are some symbiotic protozoa as well. We just don't have symbiotic protozoal supplements yet. So if you're dealing with SIBO and you're doing everything you can, you're still having issues, it might not be SIBO, it might be CMO, small intestine microbial overgrowth. So you might consider taking S. boulardii if it's possibly fungal oriented, or if you need some bacteriophages, if you think it's a virally mediated, contact me and I'll uh, put you in contact with some people in Russia that can get you bacteriophage therapy. One word about extreme diets. Some people find through uh, trial and error that they can only eat um, very limited foods. Uh, I, the carnivore diet is an example of this. You know, as soon as they eat anything other than meat, they feel ill. But if they eat just meat, they feel great. They feel great. And congratulations to people that have figured this out for themselves. It's much better to have a limited microbiome that's healthy than a big microbiome that's sick. But better than a both of those is a fully fledged uh, omnivore microbiome. Uh, here are the issues with doing something, with doing an extreme diet, and we'll take the carnivore diet as an example. If all you do is eat meat all day long, you may burn out your capacity to digest meat, and in 20 years find you can't eat meat anymore, and then you can't eat anything. The other thing is every food has a waste product it creates. And if you keep eating one food, you can overwhelm the body's capacity to remove that particular waste product. And we don't know what eating only meat's going to do in 10 years because it's a relatively new fad. Now the final thing is you really want the most robust genetic library in your microbiome. You want as many different healthy symbiotic bacteria as possible because that gives you the most amount of genetic material to draw from. And the reason that is important has been brought to us, you know, by um, the Human Genome Project and things like 23andMe, where now for $100 you can get your genome mapped. And what have people found? Oh, they, some people have um, methylation def defects, some people have histamine issues. Uh, some people have, have a particular enzyme they don't make. Uh, and, you know, in the beginning it can be kind of frightening. Oh my gosh, I have this genetic flaw that I don't do this particular thing well. Okay, but your bacteria, your microbiome may very well be able to do that for you. You might not methylate well, but your microbiome can probably methylate just fine as long as it's healthy and you have enough um, uh, bacteria there. You might not be able to handle uh, histamine reduction, but your microbiome can. You might not be able to break down a particular toxin, but your microbiome can. So don't worry about having a genetic flaw that says you are limited in the production of some key element for your health, because your microbiome has literally 1,000 times more genetic information than you do. It may be able to do the thing that you're looking for. And this is why we want a genetically diverse microbiome and not a limited one. All right, I hope you found these talks useful, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and contact me. Take care.